Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this stakeholder consultation. We're delighted to see so many of you joining from across the world. Um, my name is Emily Mates. I'm one of the ENN's technical directors, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to be um, introducing today. Um, if you can please introduce yourselves in the chat box, that would be great. Then we'll all know because you can't really see other participants. So then we'll all know who is joining us today. The agenda of what we're going to run through today, we've just got an hour, so it's not very long. So we're going to steam through some uh, some bits of information for you. It's just been put in the uh, chat box so you can see the agenda. But we're going to start with a short presentation on this wasting reset so that you all uh, have a good understanding of what's what's happening or what the plan is. Uh, we're then going to go into a brief explanation of the, the aims and processes of the UN uh, Food Systems Summit and also uh, how the wasting reset fits under action track one. Um, and we're then gonna have a moderated panel discussion. So we hope that that will be about half an hour long and then we'll wrap up and close. So we're just going to launch a poll to try and make a, the session a little bit more interactive. So we've got three small questions just in front of you. Uh, do please answer those if you feel like it. Um, the way this is going to work is that everybody's audio and video are going to be off, except for people who are speaking. But as this is a consultation, um, we really do welcome as many questions as possible. Uh, do please post them in the question and answer box. We have a team uh, ready and waiting to answer your questions. And we'll also try and uh, feed those to the panel uh, as time allows. Um, so what you can do is you can like, or it's like a type of vote uh, on the questions. So if you write a question in and or somebody writes a question in and you particularly like it, um, maybe click the like button and we'll aim to prioritize those ones that get the most likes. Unfortunately, time was a bit short to organize this consultation. So we haven't managed to do simultaneous translation into French. So we're, we apologize for that. Um, but we're very lucky we have Tram from UNICEF here uh, who's helping us with translating questions. So if you feel more comfortable posting your question in French, do please write it and Tram will translate it and we'll deal with it the same as the others. And just for your information, this session is being recorded. We will post it on ENN's website after the event and we'll let you know where that is. We'll be sending a mail out to everybody who's registered. So on, on to the first, uh, the first um, topic and uh, one of ENN's brilliant senior nutritionists, Brenda Akwani, uh, is going to tell us all about the wasting reset. Uh, so Brenda's been with us uh, for almost a year now and prior to this, she worked in numerous CSOs and U UN agencies uh, with a lot of experience from many countries. Brenda's originally from Kenya, but she's currently living in France and now is becoming fluent in either her third or fourth or fifth language. I'm not quite sure, um, but yeah, she's becoming fluent in French now as well. So over to you, Brenda. Thank you very much, um, Emily, for that introduction. We'll just start now, okay. So it's really a great pleasure to be with you all today. Over the next 10 minutes, I will give you a very brief overview of this game changer and the reset on wasting prevention, early detection and treatment to help catalyze action and accountability in this decade. Next slide, please. I wonder if any of you are asking yourselves why we feel the need to revisit the topic of wasting when so much good work has already been done. Why do we even need this game changer? So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the figures that are written on this slide. We are extremely aware of the increased risk of mortality from wasting, how over 45 million children are affected and how things are worsening with the effects of the present COVID-19 crisis and also because of the climate change. We also know that over the past decade in particular, there has been huge attention and investment on wasting. So much positive work has been done to raise awareness and action on child wasting. However, we also know the reality. The progress is simply too slow at present for global targets to be met. 
nutrition actors at national and global levels must respond to the Lancet 2021 call that I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of for a coordinated action to address the large remaining burden of undernutrition globally. And so there's no time to lose and the time has therefore come for a wasting reset. Next slide, please. The overall aim of this game changer is to initiate the discussion needed to announce a global reset on wasting. Our key output will be a manifesto. This will be a collection of agreed actions and potential commitment on wasting prevention, early detection and treatment. The manifesto will be launched at the Nutrition for Growth Summit, where member states, donors, civil society organization, and the private sector will be encouraged to make their commitments. This game changer will further provide momentum to generate the high level political support needed to ensure global wasting targets are met. It is very critical that we elevate the topic of wasting from technical domains to higher political levels and from a so um, Brenda was telling us <clears throat> that we have um, to elevate the topic of um, childhood wasting from technical domains to higher political domains to, and from a medicalized problem to food systems concern. So it, as she was saying, we're not starting from scratch. There's been considerable momentum that we are building on. And the inspiration from this reset has come from discussion with a lot of people um, who have been listed on this slide here, um, backed by the Action Track One leadership team. Indeed, an integral part of, these, of this reset will be building on the UN GAP. That's the Global Action Plan on Child Wasting and also UNICEF's upcoming No Time to Waste initiative. Um, we will also identify ways to complement the existing actions and draw in a wide range of stakeholders to further increase momentum and uptake. Next slide, please. So why are we addressing this at the UN Food Systems Summit? As you're all aware, Action Track 1 is about ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all. It's critical for mothers, infants and children to have sufficient access to safe, affordable, nutritious food and to prevent all forms of undernutrition and support the sustained recovery of wasted children, minimizing the risk of relapse. All this, of course, relies on functioning and effective food systems and pathways of care and support across sectors. Efforts to tackle wasting leverage required bridging of broader systems, of course, including food, health, agriculture and social protection. It's increasingly understood that food systems play a central role in providing nutritious diets for young children and for tackling wasting. However, a coordinated evidence-based and context-specific systems-based approach is currently lacking, contributing to the stagnation in reducing child wasting globally. Next slide, please. So uh, let me now talk you through our plan of action for this race, uh, wasting research. So we plan for a maximum of 30 people comprised of high level representatives from government, UN, academia, civil society, donors and the private sector, such as food producers. And these will all form a roundtable group. They will be provided with information from six working groups each focusing on a specific domain. So you can see the topics of these working groups in the middle column here. Of course, not all of these domains are distinct, but they are a way to come up with clear, actionable solutions in a very short period of time. The aim of the working groups is to bring together the most experienced people to share perspectives on what will work, drawing on the realities of working on the ground wherever possible. Each working group will produce a brief, hopefully quite short, not more than four pages, but articulating how we get from where we are now to the 2030 vision. This whole endeavour will involve a reset of thinking, of funding and of practice in order to reach Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is zero hunger by 2030. 
Next slide, please. So why do we think this change will work? Well, each of the briefs produced by the working groups will be carefully reviewed to ensure that firstly, they are comprehensive and cohesive. Secondly, that targets and actions are realistic and sustainable. And thirdly, that they have the ability to be delivered at scale. Members of ENN will be in each working group as facilitators just to ensure cohesion across the groups and to make sure the very short deadlines are met. Underpinning all this, it's absolutely crucial that translating what is known in technical circles is put forwards into actionable political steps, and that's the key driver of this solution. As Brenda mentioned earlier, um, we're building on a very strong platform here. Um, we'll be incorporating uh, the GAP framework and involving all the front runner countries whilst also broadening the range of stakeholders involved in the waste and reset, just to further increase the momentum and uptake of actionable solutions. Many people have been involved behind the scenes in planning this game changer, uh, representing considerable investment and buy-in already. And we have good member state support, particularly from Ethiopia, from Ireland and the US and other countries. Of course, we need more support to build more momentum and generate new ideas, um, hence this stakeholder consultation. Next slide, please. So finally, let me highlight just a few key details on this timeline. We'll all be working hard to ensure that the briefs from the six working groups are finalized by the end of next month. These briefs will be fed into the high level roundtable, who will meet in early September, hopefully, and finalize the manifesto by November. The manifesto will outline the commitment that government organizations and the private sector can make and how they will be tracked. This will enable the manifesto to be announced at the Food Systems Summit and then formally launched at the Nutrition for Growth Summit in December. Final slide, please. So uh, we hope this has given you a flavor of what's to come. We welcome your interest and thank you for your participation. And we need you to make this a success. So please do enter your questions into the Q&A section. And shortly we'll be asking the panel to respond to as many of your questions as possible. Thanks very much and back to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Phil, especially for uh, taking over at such short notice and we're sorry to Brenda that she lost her connection. That was uh, a really great presentation. Thank you. So next um, we're going to ask uh, Lawrence to um, to say a few words. Um, I, I think Lawrence doesn't need much introduction uh, as most of you will be very well aware of who he is and how important he is in our world. Um, but uh, do need to introduce a bit. So just to let you know that he is currently Gaines Executive Director and has been since 2016. Um, but very importantly for this consultation, he chairs Action Track 1 of the UN Food Systems Summit. Um, and Lawrence has, of course, had a long and illustrious career prior to GAIN, which we don't have time to cover all the many achievements that he's, he's made in his career. But I, I do think special mention must be made to a couple of things. Um, one is him being the founding co-chair and lead author of the a critically important global nutrition report for the first few years of his existence, its existence, um, but also the fact that he was awarded the World Food Prize Foundation uh, in 2018 jointly with David Nabarro. And when announcing it, the president praised their extraordinary intellectual and policy leadership in bringing maternal and child nutrition to the forefront of the global food security agenda and thereby significantly reducing childhood stunting. So over to you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you, ENN, for organizing this. And thank you, colleagues, for joining. I think we've got about 100 people on the line, which is fantastic at short notice. Um, we, we often say uh, stunting is invisible, uh, but I think wasting is even more invisible, actually. Um, it's invis if you're not in the humanitarian sector, it's, it's pretty invisible. Um, it's a smaller number than stunting, but, and that makes it more invisible, but it's a more deadly number than stunting. And I think it's a more stubborn one than stunting, although I'd have to go and check the GNR 
uh, the latest one, but my sense is that it, it, it's declining more slowly than stunting. Uh, it's certainly going to be growing in the next few years. They're standing together for nutrition consortium. Their, their, their paper on this is going to be published in July in Nature Food. And the estimates are that in the next, well, in 2020, 21 and 22, the wasting numbers are going to go up by 13.6 uh, million kids from a base of what about 46, 47 million. That's, uh, my maths isn't that brilliant, but it's about a quarter, 25% increase on the current numbers. So that's, that's shocking. But the recognition isn't growing uh, yet of, of the importance of wasting. I was talking to somebody this morning about um, minimum acceptable diets and how, which of course is not the same as wasting, but is an important uh, driver. Uh, and I was, I was saying, you know, only 17% of kids get a minimum acceptable diet. And then later on in the conversation, the person uh, regurgitated that, that stat back to me and they said, yeah, 17% of kids, 17% um, of kids don't get a minimally acceptable diet. And I said, no, 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 no. It's 83% of kids that don't get a minimally accept, accept, uh, minimally adequate diet. So I think we've also got to play a role in, in flipping some of these numbers and making it easier for advocates. So I think right now we're at a great space because when I think of how change happens, I always think it's when politics, solutions and crisis come together. So the politics, the political space, the political shifting, the fluidity of politics is, has been loosened up by these summits in 2021, the Food System Summit and the N4G Summit. And I think the fact that hunger numbers are rising, and I think the Sophie report in July is going to give us all a massive shock on the hunger numbers. I think they're going to go up by a huge amount, um, scores of millions. Um, and I, and, th and I think also the political shift landscape has shifted a little bit because of the UN's commitment, uh, especially UNICEF and WFP's commitment to the to the gap and to greater coherence and the sectors your commitment to greater coherence. That's good. On the solutions front, we have the gap. We, we have a roadmap. We, we know what to do, really. Uh, and of course, the gap isn't everything, but it's the core of everything. Uh, and we have that. And then we have the crisis. We have the COVID crisis and the economic crisis and um, the healthcare crisis and the food crisis. And all of these, and you know, crisis is always a threat, but it's always an opportunity as well. So. These three things are coming together and creating a moment for us to have an impact. So you should feel like you're in a, a moment of potential change. I think we can make a difference. Those windows open and close, but it feels like it's open at the moment. And, and I think it's really important that we call this a reset and we think of it as a reset because when you think of things that change, you can, you know, if you're at the most um, operational level, it's about different policies, different practices, different spending patterns. But if you dig one level below that, it's about different power dynamics and different partnerships. And then one level below that, it's about different mindsets. It's about thinking about things differently. And I think this is what this reset is about. It's about getting to those policies, practices, and spending allocations that are different, but starting at a position to say, we need a different mindset about wasting. So now we need to really walk, walk this talk. Um, I think we need to widen the ownership of the gap. We need to coordinate commitments better. Uh, and we need to unify our resolve to act. And we need to act at speed. As, as, as the colleagues from ENN said, we don't have much time. This window is going to close at the end of the year. So we need to, we need to jump through it and, and make sure that there's, we're not jumping out of a 10th floor window. Um, I think failure to do so, failure for failure really to grasp this moment will be very evident and very human and very tragic. So we, there's a lot at stake. And I think I, I just urge all of you to set aside, you know, egos and, and logos, uh, check them at the door. It's not easy to do. I often don't do it myself. Uh, but I think we have to, and we're obligated to, and we have a sense of duty to. So I'm, I'm really happy that this is happening, and uh, you can count on the full support 
of action track one and, and indeed all the action tracks. The moment we're at in the summit process is now, we, we uh, the, the, the um, I would say the focus is shifting now from solution generation to where are these solutions going to land? They need to land in uh, food system transformation pathways that countries are generating. So Farooz on the line, uh, we're counting on people like Farooz to say, wasting is a priority for the government of Ethiopia. And we need, we need 10 or 15 countries to say that because without that, we don't have much. So I think that's the next, the, the, the job for this group is to, is to come together with a coherent offering that is going, is likely to be effective and is focused but it's all its other job is to is to bring member states into countries into this coalition and let them drive it and let them say this is important for us that's the way we will get maximum traction at the food system summit and i would imagine at the nutrition for growth summit so you can count on action track one and and everyone in it and there's 100 people in action track one you can count on us to support all your efforts in this. Back to you, Emily. Thank you very much, Lawrence. That's very encouraging to hear um, the support from uh, not only Action Track One leadership, but across all Action Tracks. I know you have to uh, go off now to, a, to another meeting, but I'd just like to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and, and, and time with us. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in that might you might be best to answer. Stay for um, seven minutes, Emily, yeah. Oh, okay. So perhaps um, if we just look in the Q and A box, there was a there was a question particularly on the um, around the private sector, the food value chain being broad, and and the person asking was wondering how strategically and comprehensively um, the private sector is being engaged in, in in or can be engaged in wasting prevention strategy. Um, I don't know if you had any immediate thoughts. I, you know, I'm very pragmatic about this stuff, so I'm not ideological about it. If they can help, uh, and if we can set up safeguards around, um, to, you know, when you engage with the private sector, you you identify opportunity, but you also identify risk. And so, if we can maximize the opportunity and minimize the risk, and if that if that benefit cost ratio is acceptable then I think we go for it. The only metric is, will this help uh, address stunt, uh, wasting? Will this help reduce wasting? And if it does, I think we should do it, but with eyes wide open and, and you know, certainly not do it in a naive way. Great. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Okay, we'll move on to the panel discussion now so that we can get as many questions answered as possible. Um, so if possible, if, if I could ask our five um, illustrious guests to switch on their videos, um, that would be great so everybody can see you. Um, how, how we're gonna do this is rather than introduce everybody and then take a while to get back to them, I'm going to introduce them one by one and ask one question that, uh, that we've uh, either had posted in advance or we've thought about in advance. And we'll then come to uh, questions that are being posted. Um, so the first person uh, I want to say hello to and introduce and thank very much for uh, taking part is Tom Arnold. Um, who I'm sure also many of you know uh, from his many years um, of, of working in nutrition and agriculture and beyond. Um, today he's here in his role as the Irish government's special envoy for food systems. Um, Tom also holds numerous other important positions, um, including chairing the EU Commission's high-level expert group to assess the need for international platforms for food system science. He's a member of GLOPAN, which many of you know, the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems. He's a member of GAINS Board um, and also the very important Malabo uh, Montpellier panel. The list does go on, but this gives you a flavour of Tom's impressive career to date. And I think most importantly for this discussion, uh, Tom has been in, intimately involved in efforts to reduce wasting um, when he was the chief executive of Concern Worldwide, which he, a post he held for a number of years. And Concern uh, was the agency along with Valid who, who piloted uh, the community management of acute malnutrition programming, or in those days, it was known as CTC. So Tom, welcome and uh, good to see you. 
Um, in your role of uh, when you were the coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition movement, which you did for a couple of years, and with all your long experience in the successful advocacy and generation of political will and commitment for scaling up action on stunting, uh, what lessons are there for the wasting, uh, wasting community that you could share with us today? Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Emily, and delighted to be part of today. I, my starting point really would be what something that Lauren said, that when you get a conjunction between politics, solutions and crises, that's a that gives you possibilities for change. And I think that's very much was the case back in 2008, when uh, you had a food price crisis, you'd heightened political awareness of the importance of food. And you also had coming on the table uh, some very good science and that was exemplified by the Lancet report of 2008. So what we had th at that stage, and which I think is relevant now as well, are three essential issues. The first one is <clears throat> to understand the nature and scale of the problem that you're dealing with. In this case, it's wasting. As Lauren says, it's a, di it's a, different, it's, it's a different problem than stunting. But back in 2008, stunting had just come on, if you like, the, the, the political awareness that was being raised. So getting a clear sense of the scale and the nature of the, the problem. The real contribution that the Lancet report at that stage made was it identified the scale and the nature of the problem, but it also identified what to do about it. It, it, it spoke about a, a series of, uh, interventions that were well known that were already established but were not being implemented and it's it spoke as well about uh, who could make these changes what it would cost and what the benefits uh, would uh, that would arise from making these interventions and then the third issue is of course the mobilization of political will and here i, I think it's critical that you have member states countries that are willing to uh, to take the lead on this uh, in the concept note that you have developed for wasting we are talking about ireland the united states ethiopia and it may be that there are other countries can come into play so i think these three essential uh, essential issues that have to be dealt with if we're to get the change in wasting to identify understand the nature and scale of the problem coming up with clear solutions that people can understand and can identify with and getting the political will. In all of these things, what we're talking about is clarity, absolute clarity as to what it is needs to be done, how it can be done and who can do it. And I think in the, in the, in the presentation that you have made or the concept note you have made with the very good annex, you have actually already met all of these three criteria and now it's a matter of getting on and doing it. Thank you Tom, that's uh, that's very encouraging to hear we've reached some level of clarity already, we just need to as you say get on and work out the the, the, the how, um, so that's what we're hoping everybody listening will, will, will help us. Thank you, Tom. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to you for more questions. Um, our next guest that I'd like to introduce is Faru Lemma, who again, I'm sure many of you know, as he has uh, uh, been involved in nutrition programming across the world. Um, at the moment, and for a, for a while, he's been the senior advisor for the Office of the State Minister in Ethiopia. Um, he's ha also had a long career and worked in various capacities, uh, a lot of the time in higher education and teaching and learning, and health service delivery and management, as well as research. So um, Faru started his career in Ethiopia, working in Regional Health Bureau and Jimmy University, and then moved to the UK, where he spent a while at the um, London South Bank University in a position there. Moving back to Ethiopia in 2010, Peru has, has since been serving at the Ministry of Health as the Senior Nutrition Advisor since then. 
So it's lovely to have you and thank you for joining us today. I know you've, you're taking time out of a busy meeting that you're involved in around the Food System Summit. Um, but the question we have for you or would like you to ask um, immediately is that, you know, Ethiopia has, has been a country that has managed to significantly scale up treatment of severe wasting over the last few years, especially severe, but also moderate. I mean, around a quarter of a million children were successfully treated last year. So the question is, is how was this, how, what, what factors meant that political momentum was generated in order to achieve this? Because there's one thing in sort of, you know, working out the technical details, um, but as Tom and Lawrence have said, you know, you've got to have the political will and commitment um, to scale up to significant levels. Um, so what factors supported and convinced the decision makers in Ethiopia uh, to do this? Yeah, thank you very much. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think, as you said, Ethiopia started in working on the management of acute malnutrition in around 20 years ago, two decades. And I think uh, at the start, uh, when CIMA was starting and st being implemented in Ethiopia, there was quite a big experience uh, supported by uh, development partners in the UN in terms of in ma mainly in emergency responses which later developed to uh, convince the government that it is necessary to have a national system that could support in, in terms of addressing the issue of wasting, particularly focused on treatment of SAM and MAM. Uh, based on that, I think that it was fully integrated within our primary healthcare system, where uh, frontline workers, health extension workers were engaged since 2008 in terms of delivering the services. So the whole government commitment was could be seen in using the system as well as supporting the uh, existing de development of the guidelines and directives, but also in terms of su supply chain management, as well as coordinating the efforts that are being done by various partners. And I think there was quite a, a continued support overall, and that we have started with 100,000 kind of thing, and we have reached last year to uh, actually half a million it's, uh, the treatment last year in some uh, by 1.8 million in terms of mom in mothers and as well as children so the government commitment is could be seen by heart has been implemented and has expanded and through these it also supports in terms of what could be done to identify early those children at risk particularly in areas that are food insecure using the existing system as well as the monitoring and evaluation so that the ideas and the quality of service could be improved, but also early detections could be uh, addressed in terms of uh, engage increasing issues of malnutrition, particularly in terms of wasting. So there have been quite a commitment. And I think, as uh, most of you have said, the government has continued in terms of simplifying our how the way we go forward but also including it what is create currently being developed. Particularly this morning, we had just included a uh, uh, reset wasting, uh, prevention of wasting as one of our game changers. Both under the action track one and five, uh, it needs to be endorsed by our curators and conveners, but it has been already taken up, over. Thank you so much, Faru. Um... We look forward to hearing what, um, what what comes through from that. I've just seen a few questions popping up in the chat. Some people are a little worried that this sort of focus on wasting and the reset on wasting maybe will reinforce the silos between stunting and wasting rather than, um, you know, move forward holistically. So I just want to reassure everybody that, yes, the focus is wasting, um, but we're very much looking towards, well, you know how can how can the two be be acted upon together wasting does need treatment and it needs urgent treatment obviously and it needs to be scaled up but certainly through all the prevention and early detection that is where there are very very obvious links with stunting pre prevention and early detection um, and at, here at ENN most of the work we do is on looking at uh, breaking down the silos between stunting and wasting and other forms of undernutrition. So we're certainly going to be um, focusing on that as well. We're not going to uh, separate, uh, do more, more work to uh, increase the silos rather than separate. 
Great, thank you so much, Faroo. Uh, the next guest that we're going to introduce and, and ask a question to is Erin Boyd, um, who is a nutrition advisor at U USA to the, Uni the United States Agency for International Development, the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. So Erin has over 15 years of experience in emergency nutrition. She's seen most uh, countries where there's been serious emergency problems, um, particularly in Darfur, Haiti and Pakistan. Um, and at USAID, Erin provides technical expertise um, to the humanitarian nutrition responses and also uh, operational research related to improving the quality and scale of wasting treatment. So Erin is the perfect person to represent uh, the US today. Erin, um, we're talking today about the scale up of wasting prevention, early detection and treatment. Um, what does USAID see as opportunities to support this scale up of wasting programming? Thank you, Emily, and hello, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here with so many wonderful faces and experts. Um, USAID, interestingly, we, we have embarked on an internal process to really try to better define and identify the comparative advantage that we may have in supporting wasting programming more broadly. So I think most are, people are familiar with the support that USAID has given for over 20 years, as many of you have already referenced. And in the past years, we really have been supporting through emergency funds, approximately $200 million a year on, on wasting treatment in normally, and it, it ebbs and flows, but approximately 20 countries. And what we've really been trying to do through this internal process is to better outline how we can not only use emergency funds and humanitarian platforms, but where other bureaus, so particularly the Bureau for Global Health and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where those two bureaus can also come in to support wasting, hopefully earlier in the continuum, so through some of the prevention efforts, et cetera. Um, USAID, Lawrence mentioned spending patterns, and this really is where USAID is, is also looking to see how we can access different pots of money in order to try to look at that continuum more broadly. So we certainly have, have embraced the concept of a continuum of care, and as Emily is, is very familiar, we've supported over the years a lot of research in collaboration with UNICEF and ENN in particular um, to look at some of the overlaps. So I think, I don't remember already who mentioned, I think in the, in the q and I saw a reference to the concurrent wasting and stunting. So we've been supporting research related to concurrent wasting and stunting to see some of those risks. And, and Tom mentioned earlier just how stunting really took off in 2008 as such a focus and USAID has supported a lot of stunting reduction. Um, but now trying to look at some of those concurrent and, and children who have both forms of malnutrition, how can we do a better job of identifying their needs earlier? Also on the research front around wasting, we are trying to bring in some of those humanitarian learning experiences. So again, trying to increase the scale and quality of wasting programming. And what can we learn from some of the emergency work? So in Ethiopia, for example, how can we build upon that to scale in countries where there may not be humanitarian crises that have been identified, but there certainly is a very high burden of wasting. Um, and I think also just to your question, Emily, we as USAID, as you know, have a, have a big role in food technology. I think the nutrition team at USAID has continued to build in that capacity. So I think around food safety and hygiene and also looking at all the different specialized nutritious foods that have been supported by the US government for years and years how to look at formulations, how to look at different needs, and not only anthropometry and nutritional outcomes, but really looking at some of the other pieces related to cognition and, and long-term outcomes in terms of disease risk, et cetera. Um, and then finally, well, two other small points, I think just that are important to USA. One is related to the value chain work. And I think on child diets, there's so much potential for USAID through different countries and the mission support to really build on that work to look at prevention um, of wasting and, and other forms of undernutrition. But we definitely have a huge area when it comes to value change to looking at diet quality and to doing a better job of outlining what can be done to improve diets much earlier, again, on that continuum of care. 
And, and linked to that, I would say one of the areas where our sort of health and emergency colleagues definitely see very much eye to eye, and there's a lot of passion and, and momentum around this space is on complementary feeding. And I think that this is such a critical area where USAID has supported for years in many countries work around infant and young child nutrition, but really adding in that maternal piece and trying to figure out with maternal diets, with prenatal care, and also just really looking at child, not only the diet, but also feeding practices and what caregivers can, can be able to do to really look at that prevention part of wasting. And that's a big area, not only of programming um, and overlap, but also I think around the research piece. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erin. That was great. So our next uh, guest that I'd like to introduce is uh, Patrizia Fracasti. So Patrizia is a senior nutrition and food systems officer at um, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and where she leads the work on governance, policies, programs, and investments. Uh, previously, many of you might have known Patrizia when she was the senior nutrition analyst and strategy advisor at the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement Secretariat. Um, prior to that, Patrizia worked many years uh, for NGOs and UN agencies across a number of countries and has a particular interest in the political economy of nutrition. So Patrizia, um, FAO and WFP submitted a game changer on the UN gap for child wasting, which we've heard quite a bit about today, uh, under action track five, which is the resilience uh, action track. Um, and at the request of the leadership that's uh, been included within this solution cluster under action track one. Uh, so what I'm interested in or would like uh, to hear your thoughts on is, is uh, what do you think are the factors? What are we going to need to do um, to ensure that the, this lens of resilience is maintained during this reset on wasting? Over to you, Pat. Thank you so much, uh, Emily, and uh, hello to everyone. So the, we, we submitted the global action plan on ending child wasting on behalf of all the UN agencies that have been behind the plan and also uh, on behalf of all the front runner countries that uh, are supporting the gap. So it was really, we were just submitting. Uh, but the reason of choosing the action track five on building uh, resilience was that we really saw uh, the gap as being essential to build the resilience because we wanted to ensure that the most vulnerable individuals are uh, visible in actions and policies uh, that are designated to build the resilience from socioeconomic and environmental shocks and stressors. And also in line with building resilience, we thought that a multi-systemic approach that the GAP is promoting is the way forward. So really uh, emphasizing that it's not only about food systems, but it's also about wash, health, social protection. So really bringing that multi-systemic lens and really taking into account uh, the drivers and the seasonal patterns that affect the life of people. And I think that's really important to maintain also now that uh, you know, we are together under action track one. And uh, as I mentioned with the gap, we really hope to bring the political support of the countries because uh, countries that have committed to be part of the gap, they are already developing their own operational roadmaps and that's really important because it's something that is uh, led by the countries. And so we thought that uh, the gap was bringing that political support and we wanted to highlight some of the solutions that are already being presented in these operational roadmaps. So I, I really think that it's great that uh, we have been asked to merge uh, the gap with the um, reset, um, child wasting reset uh, solutions. And I really look forward uh, yeah, to the way forward, to the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrizia. Yes, we, we're, we're really excited about this as well. 
So coming last, but very definitely not least, um, is Saul Guerrero, who is the Senior Nutrition Advisor for Emergency Nutrition at UNICEF headquarters. Now, Saul has spent uh, much of the last two decades driving efforts to improve the way we prevent and treat child wasting in both in emergencies and non-emergencies across over 20 countries uh, around the world. Um, prior to joining UNICEF, Saul worked with Action Against Hunger and then also uh, earlier, Valid International um, in the uh, research and development of this theme and approach that we've heard of. So Saul, great to have you here. And um, I'd just like uh, you to say a few words on, uh, uh, so of everything that's going on at the moment, what are you most excited about that will bring us closer to this reset on wasting? Thank you, Emily, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. I think what I'm most excited about when it comes to this reset is that the reset is already happening, um, that it's not an aspirational thing that we now have to figure out how do we trigger or, or catalyze, that, uh, that the reset is something that is starting to happen, not quite organically, right? But it's happening in multiple dimensions. And what we need to figure out is a way to streamline and coordinate and accelerate, right? That that is the, the actual challenge. And, the reason why I say that it's happening is because of the many of the things that have been said by, by the speakers before me, including the launch of the Global Action Plan on Child Wasting. If we wanted it to be wasting to become an issue that goes beyond technicians, well, you can do uh, 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 worse than the UN Secretary General commissioning uh, the world to develop a Global Action Plan to address it. Um, as uh, Patricia said as well, not only to address it as something that one system does or that we, you know, focuses only on one dimension of it, but as a multi-systemic problem with multi-systemic solutions. So it feels like that's already um, uh, a huge catalyst to move this forward. Seeing how the countries have responded to this opportunity and the level of government support and, and, and leadership that we have seen, to Lauren's earlier point, I don't think we need to ask ourselves, how do we get governments now to do this? We already have six, seven countries that have already sent to us, not the other way around, their global action plan roadmaps with targets, with levels of ambitions, with priorities. And we expect to have another six or more uh, over the next uh, month um, finalized. So we already have the government leadership that we won. We just now need to give them the platform, right, to get the recognition that they need, and we need to support them um, in, in the way that, um, that they need in order to be able to put them into place. But it's also uh, elevating this conversation beyond the traditional stakeholders. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had an action review panel on child wasting, which many of your organizations and yourselves attended, and that was chair uh, by Minister Morton from the UK government and our executive director, and it brought together uh, a range of partners, including philanthropies that came directly to the table to say, here we are, stepping up and bringing resources that are not currently on the table, right, and that haven't been on the table before and that we're bringing to the table, along with a commitment to leverage even more. Right? So we're starting to have people pull in our direction for and with us. So that already feels incredibly exciting. As you alluded to earlier as well, I mean, we have spent much of the last two years also piecing together this no time to waste narrative, which is, it began very much as a, as a UNICEF effort to try to identify some of these big ticket items and, and priorities and trying to put them in, in writing. But the Secretary General and, 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 the, and the leadership of, of, of the UN agencies has also started to discuss whether or not that should be a UN wide plan not just a UN conversation. Is it a new thing? Not necessarily. It just captures a lot of the things that we have been doing and discussing, and it brings it all together. So all in all, what I, I and one finally and really, really important thing, people say that governments are, not, are committed verbally, but are not showing it where it matters. And I now know for a fact that that is not necessarily true. Over the last six months, we launched an RUTF match fund that literally just says to national governments, we believe that you can put resources towards a commodity that historically has been seen as something that governments wouldn't buy. And within six months, we already have three national governments already made commitments from their national budgets for the first time to purchase our UTF and six other countries already in discussions to do the same. I know that that's not the full spectrum of what we need governments to fund, but hey, if we can do it with the hardest, most expensive commodity involved in all of this, I think that there's an awful lot of reasons to be optimistic and excited about the future. Thank you. Thanks all. Yes, indeed there are. And as you say, it's great that there's been these commitments, uh, these roadmaps already from six countries and we look forward to seeing many, many more. 
Um, great, so we, we don't have a huge amount of time left, um, but what we're gonna try and do now is get to some of the questions um, that you've been posting. Um, so first, um, Tom, if we can ask you this question, this would be great. Um, so the question is to date, most efforts to address um, this life-threatening condition of wasting has have focused on treating it rather than preventing it. How the question is, how should we reset this narrative change into funding? So how do we how do we get from from treatment, which we still need to scale up, but also into prevention and funding? I think this whole question of where the, the idea of prevention fits in, in broad public policy just needs to be further emphasized. Because you know there's the old uh, saying, "A stitch in time saves nine. And it, it's just more efficient from every point of view, from a human welfare point of view, from a financial point of view, from a health outcome point of view. So uh, to to invest more in prevention. And so I think one of the things that has to or should emerge from this reset on wasting, is a much clearer agenda as to what is need what needs to happen in order to achieve greater levels of prevention. I don't have all the details of that. But I'm sure ENN, ENN has, but I think that's the core issue. And uh, having that that clarity of uh, policy agenda, and then ensuring that that's taken up at the country level. Because there's there's a couple of comments have come through and, and Saul has eloquently spoken about it as well and Conal Foley also in his in his contribution there spoke about the need for a critical mass of countries to come in behind this initiative and that I think is critical but so it's not but it's not just having a number of countries it's having clarity as to what countries should do how it fits within their existing uh, institutional structures and health systems. And that I think that's the way forward. Thank you, Tom. That's great. Um, so for Rue, there's been a question posted around um, estimates of um, that waste of estimates of wasted children are, are generally an underestimate, and we know this. I mean, then we measure by prevalence rather than incidence, which is a better measure for 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 wasting. Um, do you have any sense in Ethiopia what the the actual the real scale of wasting is, and therefore what program coverage rates are, and and therefore what the funding requirements are? I know this is quite a tricky question, so don't worry if you don't have the answer on the top off the top of your head, but um, yeah, I think. Thank you. I think in terms of uh, uh, Sam, I think severe acute malnutrition. The number is yes high. Uh, what we reach is quite uh, around 80, 90 percent, uh, based on the information we have uh, from what we get from the, our DHIs. Uh, but in terms of uh, the current or last year, the event with the pandemic, but also flooding, desert locusts, and displacements, the numbers have started increasing and particularly in areas where displacement is there, there is quite different and we have started different approaches, simplified approaches and things like that to cover uh, with the resources we have. Uh, we had a shortage, uh, difficulty in supply management and we have been generating from government but also from development partners uh, together with uh, our country office UNICEF that's leading, helping us in terms of identifying the resources to secure that, but the number has gone up. I, I can, I cannot give you the exact number now on top of my head, but yes, it has increased, and there is quite uh, a large number of uh, things to address. But uh, supply is also not easy. Uh, we had until a couple of months, and we are looking for to extend that until the end of the year. But the supply has been also continuously being supported by development partners, particularly by UNICEF at the country level, uh, and also our development partners. USA and uh, the UK government as well. Over. Great, thank you so much, Faru. Um, Saul, so we'd like to come. I'd like to come to a question to you, for you because I think this 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 kind of issue doesn't get responded to very often. But uh, yourself as a Venezuelan national, um, there was a question around uh, the indigenous people are the most effective within regions of Latin America, um, and you know what will be done about this. It, I don't know if again it's 
off the top of your head, but I don't know if you'd have any response to um, how to reach the hardest, um, most vulnerable people in, in the South American context. Yeah, I think it's uh, understanding those different vulnerabilities, right, and, and how specific com uh, communities and populations are marginalized. It has to be a part of what we do, not only in Latin America, but in every context, right? In Latin America, it absolutely is the indigenous populations, but in other contexts might be different populations. Um, specifically in Latin America, what, what we have seen with a lot of nutrition programming is that it requires a fundamentally different nutrition program, not only because the services that are available are very, very different, but also that the engagement with that population very often, um, uh, well, it has to be fundamentally different to what has been, um, what is done for uh, the non-indigenous populations. My sense though, is that we need to start um, by taking, um, uh, smaller steps rather than thinking that we need to solve it, uh, uh, the problem as a whole. And what I mean by, by smaller steps is that is, first of all, m being more systematic about asking ourselves that question, who is the marginalized population and why are they the marginalized population? Uh, and in the case of the indigenous population, as I said, I, I, I think that that's, that's already quite clear. And then asking ourselves um, equally on, uh, on an equally systematic basis, what is it that will make our services for those populations not only available, but truly accessible and taking the time to make sure that those um, uh, programs reflect that understanding of the, the uniqueness of the needs of that population, but also the, 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 yeah, the, the, the specific health and behaviors and understandings of that population. Mm. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, time maybe just for one last question. Um, one that's been voted on quite a lot would be for you, um, uh, Patricia, if possible. I'm just finding it, hold on. Yes, um, so um, what do you think, you, you know, the treatment and prevention interventions that we talked about um, uh, that and, and that Lancet has outlined as being effective, um, how much of a food systems issue is this? Um, I wonder if you'd be able to, to give a quick answer, Patrizia. Yeah, I mean, the, basically the people live in a food system. So yeah, that's, that's my very short answer. So it is a really, um, it has to do with the individual, with the household, with the community and the ecosystem and uh, being in an urban or rural area. So yeah, it is about food system if you want to take a systematic view. But I really want to emphasize that often, and that's why we wanted the gap to be in the resilience uh, action track, the most vulnerable are not seen. And that's really a, an issue because they, yeah, they developed and designed programs for the vulnerable, but then the individuals are not seen. And that's really what we want to bring with the gap to make the children visible. Thank you, Patrizia. We'll be relying on you to remind us of that all the way through. <laughs> Um, sadly, we've run out of questions, to, uh, run out of time to take any more questions, and there are a few unanswered ones le left. So what we're going to do is um, we will try and collate them and provide some answers and send that out in, into a mail out to everybody who's registered. Um, we're just going to post another to a poll, quick one, just to ask a couple of questions on what your thoughts are about the last hour. Um, quite a few people are asking about um, the working groups and the TOR. Do please post your email address in the Q&A box or in the chat box and we will make sure that you receive the information which is hopefully going out on Sunday or Monday um, once we've got through this. Um, yes, so we'll summarise um, anything that was left from today and so all that's left is to thank every, all of you for joining and especially to thank all of our esteemed guests um, for taking the time to join the panel and to everybody for listening and actively taking part. Um, so thank you very much and we'll hopefully speak soon. Goodbye. <laughs>